Uh, my name is Dan Booth, and today we're going to be talking about the happy accident that is Apache Iceberg and how it is disrupting the data industry. So just a quick note about me. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Weeks. Uh, I'm one of the co-creators of Apache Iceberg at Netflix, along with my co-founder, Ryan Blue. I'm also uh, co-founder of, CT of uh, Tabular and CTO there. So the first thing I want to talk about is just a little bit about what Apache Iceberg is. We talk about it as a universal analytic table format. And the way that you think about this is Iceberg really upgrades what a data lake is to be more like a data warehouse. It provides a lot of the benefits and behaviors of a data warehouse on top of object storage, lake storage. It also brings a whole new host of capabilities, things like time travel, branching, tagging. We'll get into some of these throughout the talk. But the idea here is that Iceberg is really a revolutionary way of storing data and storing table data uh, to provide SQL behaviors. So going back to kind of where we started, this is a little bit of a joke here, but you know, Excel and you know, kind of primitive ways of thinking about data is really where a lot of the data processing industry started, especially in the distributed space. We started off as distributed engineers and not really thinking about data in the context of warehousing, but thinking about it as a engineering challenge. How do we actually multi-process data, split it up, uh, process huge amounts of logs, and do that in a reasonable amount of time? The very earliest iterations of this were really built on top of file systems. So HDFS and some of those early papers that came out were the foundation of how we think about data processing today. And it was only after that that we got MapReduce and some of the concepts of working with that data. However, early on, like guarantees, uh, behaviors, things like that were abandoned from the early days of SQL and data warehousing in order to tackle the engineering challenge of distributed processing. So at Netflix, we started with this very early. And Netflix was one of the first large scale uh, uh, data warehouses in the cloud. And what we were doing is we were taking a lot of the technologies that had existed in the, the data center, Hadoop, HDFS, and trying to use those in the cloud and running into many challenges along the way. Some were inherent to those technologies and others were, were actually driven by that cloud migration. So these three main areas are things that we as a platform team were trying to address and ultimately resulted in Iceberg being kind of the solution for those. The first thing is correctness issues, just being able to atomically mutate a data set. There are a lot of cases where you would actually get incremental changes or you could get partial results or you'd have uh, challenges with things like S3 and eventual consistency that would cause problems for being able to accurately interrogate data. The next thing is cost and performance. We were operating at a very large scale at the time and being able to process huge amounts of data was difficult. The cloud actually exacerbated this problem because operations in the cloud take a lot longer than they do in a system like HDFS. So a list operation in S3, which can be inconsistent, can also take 100 milliseconds plus. And when you're working with thousands, millions of partitions and directories, that causes some real problems. Uh, and then the last thing is actually data engineering and pro productivity. All of these problems with correctness, problems with scalability, problems with the underlying representation, we surfaced all the way up to the data engineer. This is something that every analyst and data engineer had to learn about, and they had to deal with at, you know, as part of their practice of data engineering, where in reality, they just wanted things to behave the way that SQL systems behave. So I mentioned that Iceberg is a table format, and this is something that's actually confusing to a lot of people because Table formats share a lot of conventions with file formats. They have a schema, they have columns, they have data. But what is really the difference between, say, a parquet file and an iceberg table? Well, the reality is that a, a file itself does have some of those conventions, but when you have two files that are sitting next to each other, are they part of the same data set? Well, obviously, if they share the same schema, if everything about them looks the same, you can process them together. However, if you have many of those, if those schemas of the actual file change over time, if they have different layouts and locations, what really constitutes the data set at that point? 
So what Iceberg does is it actually tracks all of this information and provides a way to consistently interrogate your data, know what is part of the data set and what is not, and then how does it change over time. A good way to compare this is against legacy formats like Hive tables. How do those things differ? Well, Hive was really built on top of some of those things that I mentioned earlier, file systems, directories. They were really using some of the lower level conventions of the early distributed processing in order to achieve SQL-like behaviors. Those came over time, but they still use those fundamental conventions. We'll take a look at a couple of those. A good example is, you know, Hive tracks directories. Whatever files happen to be in those directories are part of your data set. But changing those things means like you're dropping files into directories and you can't do that uh, atomically across many different files. You also have to list those directories to figure out what is part of that data set. There are uh, scale and performance challenges of that because of these listing operations and in the cloud, those operations get much slower. So Iceberg takes a very different approach to this. It doesn't rely on a file system. We like to talk about the fact that everything is immutable, it's fully reachable, and there's really a tree of metadata that's tracked, and changes to the table can be fully acid compliant because you're really changing from one tree to another tree, and taking the minimal set of changes that you need in order to move that data set forward. So we'll take a couple of examples and run through these quickly, just what these problems actually look like because they manifest as issues that users run into as well. A good example is this listing of directories. If somebody is coming to a data set that was curated by somebody using Hive, if they were a good data engineer, they laid out their table and they've got a timestamp for when the event actually happened, but they also need to partition the data so they get some better performance. So typically you would have like a day and hour partitioning. But an analyst who's familiar with SQL will sit down and just say, oh, well, I'm gonna, query for the time range that I care about. And, and maybe I've got some you know, uh, time zone information and other things that I'm gonna include in that. But this is actually quite bad because, oops, full table scan. This, day, this analyst forgot to include the partitioning information along with the actual time that they want to use. Now the problem with this is the time for the actual event and the time for the partitioning can actually be out of sync too. So you can run into problems where you actually have to create a more complicated query in order to get the range of data that you want. Sometimes you have to get broader ranges, especially if those times don't align with each other. There's even a problem here because they tried to now account for this and not do a full table scan, but the or condition causes a problem and you end up with another full table scan. These are just the kind of problems where you're exposing those file system behaviors all the way up to the user and now they have to deal with it as part of their analytics. So yeah, you can do this correctly. You can come up with statements. They get very complicated, and this is about as simple as it can be, because if you're working with multiple tables, multiple data sets, you have to construct these kind of queries to get the accurate set of information that you want. Finally, we can actually see that this scans the data that we just wanted, but can we do better than this? And the answer is yes. Iceberg takes a very different approach to this. So we don't require that you actually use partitioning as a separate concept from things like timestamps. You can do identity partitioning, but you can also do transform. So in Iceberg, if you lay out your data correctly and you use the proper partitioning, you can actually just do a time-based partitioning. This is something that any analyst, any SQL person that sits down would expect, and they would actually get the behavior that they want. Another thing that we do is we optimize the way that we lay out data for object stores. So this is what we call the object store layout. Hive partitioning, having paths that kind of constitute different, uh, uh, different segments of data does not work well in S3. You get hotspots, you get 503s, and then if you have small files and other problems, all of these things compound on each other to get really poor performance on object stores. So Iceberg, decouples the way that you lay out data from the actual logical data itself. And this allows us to do things like this where we can shard very finely across different partitions and that ends up working very well for something like S3. So 
if somebody is doing en uh, data engineering for this, all they need to do is partition by that timestamp, and then also you'll take care of things like time zone offsets and other things that the engine can leverage in order to automatically filter to the correct timestamp time stamp range. So a lot of what I'm talking about here in terms of Iceberg is really just restoring some of the SQL fundamentals that have existed since you know, the 80s when the first SQL standards were released. What we're doing is we're kind of bringing back those conventions now that we've solved a lot of the distributed processing challenges and making sure that people can really trust the data that they're working with. So a good example of this and what hurts a lot of engineers uh, working in systems that are like Hive is many of those SQL behaviors are not preserved. You say, hey, is uh, you know, renaming a column in a data set the same thing as you would uh, get from performing a drop column and add column. No, data should be preserved. But in a lot of these systems, because they're working on files, CSV, Parquet, they have different conventions for how they do operations like this. And it means that it can be surprising to anybody who's using the system, because they need to know how does the engine behave and how does that file format interact with the engine. Some project by position, some project by name. And if you're trying to get multiple of these working together and they have different conventions, you can never get a system that actually works across all of them. And if somebody makes a change, it may look correct in one engine, but you only find out that it's wrong when you start using a different one. And those are really difficult problems to address because you have to, you have to know that the problem exists and sometimes it can be uh, very hard to uncover because it just shows up as null values. It's not there anymore. Another example is dropping a, column and, dropping a column and adding a column. We call this zombie data, the zombie data problem, because in a traditional relational database, you drop, you drop something and it should actually discard those values, even if you add the same named thing back. But in the hive world, a lot of times this would result in bringing back data because it has the same name in the parquet file or it has the same position within a CSV file. So you get these weird situations that months later, somebody goes and makes a change to the data set and you resurrect data that shouldn't be there. So Iceberg addresses a lot of these challenges and the goal is to make it a standard to restore some of this SQL behavior. So what are some of the advantages of using Iceberg beyond correcting for these things? Well. It has expressive SQL. You can use it for row level operations. Because of the guarantees that we provide, you can actually allow engines to build complicated logic on top of these fundamentals and build things like dynamic partition pruning, storage uh, optimized joins, things that the engines can actually leverage from the format and then provide guarantees about how it transitions the state of that table to a new state. New features like time travel and rollback. These are really important for data engineers and analysts because if your data set changes in some way and you don't necessarily trust what you're seeing, you can compare one state of the table to a prior state of the table. You can actually incrementally uh, read from the table so you can just see what changes happen. All of these capabilities are a part of how we structure the metadata in Iceberg. And we can also create better engineering patterns out of this. There are some good examples of being able to audit data, uh, branching, tagging, ways to experiment with your data without impacting the actual production data set, but you get full access to that data. One of the key things that we like to think about is declarative data engineering. You tell the, the, the data set or you describe in the data set the ideal state for that data set and then the systems that are working with it can try and achieve that state. It also allows things to come in behind the scenes and make changes to the table as maintenance functions to get closer to that desired state. But it doesn't put the, uh, the requirement on all of the, the people interacting with the table that they always have to adhere to those things. There are many more things uh, in terms of performance, flexible strategies for you know, how you do uh, updates to the table, background optimization services, all of these are enabled by providing these core capabilities of the table format. 
So we call this a happy accident. And the reason for that is when we started, we didn't really understand what problem we were solving. We were initially just trying to get Spark and Trino and Flink all to work together in the same data set. But really what that ended up being and unlocking and is apparent now is that it was an, a universal analytic storage representation. Once you have a few different things that can all speak that same language, pretty much everything can. And that opens this up to any sort of batch processing, compute, systems that know how to read and operate with icebergs. And now we're seeing this major shift in terms of different vendors supporting it, different technologies, everything from graph databases to streaming systems, all interacting with icebergs because once they have a common language that they can speak, they can all interact with the data together. So this definitely star solves a much larger problem in this ecosystem, which is how do we share storage? Global access to object stores means that we now have almost universal storage, but we still need to speak the same language in, in order to work with that. We call this a quiet revolution because for the longest time, Every database really wants to hold your data and do your compute. And this is the joke that we have about databases is nobody wants to give up the data layer, but the interoperability is so important to everybody. Like you want to own your data, you want to bring compute to it. So there are still companies that are drawing 25 and they want to say like, oh, it's best if you store it in our format but they're gonna be pushed by the market because everything else is starting to work together at a very rapid pace. Storage neutrality is incredibly important. You, you want to be able to access your data where it lives and not hire data engineers to move all that data around and restructure it to fit into different systems. This creates modularity where you can build your infrastructure using many different components that serve your needs. As I mentioned, like you may have graph use cases, you may have Python use cases where people just wanna work with a very lightweight version of smaller data sets. But you may also need incredibly large ETL tools, Spark, Trino, whatever it happens to be. And there's a growing number of vendors that support Iceberg, so you can incorporate those into your ecosystem where you need specialized capability. You control your data and you build on open standards. This is kind of the core philosophy behind what Iceberg is. And then we're gonna jump into a couple predictions. For a long time we've talked about separation of compute and storage, but this is really the separation of the, or the unbundling of your storage from compute. You know, the, the early days it was just like, hey, cloud storage and one compute engine. Now we're really talking about cloud storage and any compute engine. This allows you to kind of construct your platform, bring the tools that you need to solve your problems, and it unbundles this entire ecosystem. What it also does is it decouples so that you can kind of focus on specialized use cases, but also work with centralized data storage. Lastly, if you put this picture together, and kind of where Tabular sits in this ecosystem is you, know, you have your actual storage, you have those formats, but you still need things that support that. You need maintenance, you need optimization, you need a way to expose these to all of those engines with security. This is what Tabular provides, and we interact with a lot of these different compute engines in order to just manage that storage. Take some of the challenges that you have about maintaining a platform in a warehouse, handle those as a fast-based product, and then you can pick and choose what technology you want to use on top of it. And that, thank you very much. We're right at the end of our time, and I don't think we probably have